Okay, so the topic of this talk is uh, people products with ML or Qflow. So maybe we'll jump straight to some of the takeaways. Basically, these are the messages that I want to convey to you in this talk. Okay. One, building an ML platform on Kubernetes and Qflow makes a lot of sense, and we'll walk through why that worked at Goja. And two, we're going to introduce Feast, or a feature store that we built at Goja and open source. And what we're going to show is that through a demo, using Feast with Qflow allows us to, allows data scientists to quickly intro our models and deploy them into production. And this architecture is just a quick um, highlight of, of how that process works. If you just need to ingest the data into two stores and then you train your model in the warehouse and serve it with the Feast server. So, a quick agenda. Um, I'll cover the Goji side of things, the evolution of our tech stack um, as we developed our platform and some of the decisions we made and why uh, Kubernetes made sense and Kubernetes made sense in that case. Um, then we'll walk through a quick demo with Chris on Feast and Fairing, one of the new components of Kubernetes. And we'll deploy, and try to deploy a model there with uh, Jupyter Notebook and Kubernetes. And then uh, Chris will cover some of the latest developments on the Kubernetes side. So if any of you don't know, Kubeflow is an open source ML platform built on top of Kubernetes by Google Cloud AI team. Um, it's, it's really completely open source and you can find it online, kubeflow.org. Um, I'm going to assume that most of you have already heard of it at least, so I'll just dive into the specifics. Um, for any of you that don't know Gojek, I just quickly want to give an introduction again. Uh, Gojek is a, a technology startup from Indonesia. Uh, we're most famous for ride hailing on motorcycles, so go ride, uh, but we branched into many other services and products like go food, uh, food delivery, uh, go uh, car, uh, ride with cars, go pay digital payments, uh, and just services like go box and go send, and many other private services. In total, we're in about 18 different products and services, um, and all together the 4.2 super app uh, with the goal of uh, solving every workday need that you have. In Singapore, there's only ride hailing at the moment, cars, we have to have more services soon. Uh, just a little bit about our scale. So the three biggest products we have are, uh, firstly, the ride heading. We have over 2 million drivers and process more than 100 million bookings um, every month. Any given point in time, just hundreds of thousands of drivers online um, on our platform. For food delivery, we're one of the largest food delivery services in Southeast Asia, about 400,000 merchants on the platform. And, uh, for Go, for digital payments, GoPay, also one of the largest uh, e-wallets in Southeast Asia. So the scale is really, really large and the ability for us to impact these systems with ML and data science is, is immense. And it's not just these products, of course, there's a long tail of many other products that we launch and there are many potential touch points for ML and data science. And I think a lot of you have seen this slide before. It's one of my favorites. It's the data in Jakarta, where each pixel represents a person being picked up or dropped off in the city on a ride. I'm just on motorcycles on a ride and go uh, ride. Um, and I think this illustrates just the volume of data we have and how data is important to our decision making. So today, a lot of these decisions and transactions and bookings are um, done through machine learning and intelligent systems, not necessarily machine learning, in a lot of cases, machine learning. Uh, but we didn't get there. Uh, we originally had to start building the platform from somewhere. And our team was tasked with making the decision on how to build up this platform to support all of our use cases, not just specific use cases. Um, so when we originally started, we didn't know we should be using a managed service. I think Jan was illustrating a lot of what exists today at Google. Um, some of that did exist in different forms earlier. It's hard to know if you start on VMs, do you build from scratch, do you use Kubernetes, do you use uh, something like SageMaker? or any other Google services. But when we started, we looked at the problem space. And we, you can kind of uh, put the problem space out like this if you look at the business impact versus engineering complexity. And what you'll find is that uh, as the business impact increases, some of your core services like your recommendations, like food, for example, or anything that's like cards on the homepage of that application, uh, search, uh, pricing engine, or search pricing. These are critical businesses, systems that um, process hundreds of millions of transactions every month, or in some cases, it would be faster than that. Um, so obviously, that will have a lot more engineering requirements. And we also have a long tail of other smaller tasks that require ML and data science. So let's say an analyst that just wants to train a model to do some forecasting, uh, it's not going to go into production. 
but he wants a different experience. So that the, that the platform should solve both of these, these cases. So the data science side, you want high abstraction. You want customizability, um, but mostly you want abstractions. It's a user interface or a notebook or something that empowers that person to do more. But on the engineering side, the requirements are different. You often, especially in a company like Gojek, you have um, hundreds of engineers from many different systems. You want to be able to get a platform that supports the non happy case, the edge cases. So you want flexibility in the engineering systems, you want to break abstraction. Uh, you want to be able to maintain that uh, the system in production at scale. So the platform needs to support both these cases. And looking at the requirements, looking at the problem space, we wanted to look at, uh, support at least one or two of our people business systems. So we, we focused on one of these at the start, which is driver allocation. And we knew it was going to be a complex engineering system. And so we were really leaning towards something that gives us the highest abstraction, but also flexibility. Um, so this problem is basically a, a classic problem in writing of which driver you send to a customer. And you can look at this in different ways, but this decision is very important if you're processing hundreds of millions of uh, orders. Uh, it, it impacts the customer experience, and it impacts the driver's opportunities, earnings, it impacts the bottom line of the company, depending on which driver you send. And this seems like an easy problem, but it is actually very important to do this correctly. And it, the machine learning models and systems here uh, have a big impact on, on the bottom line. And so because we knew this was going to be an engineering system, and we knew that we need to have, uh, we need to get scan patches here, decided to stand out Kubernetes. And so what we did is we built a very basic system at the start. This was a long time ago, but originally it was very simple. We just had an info pipeline, a training model, and a package that went to the REST API and deployed this in the of Kubernetes. That model was the service we received the request, just as the virus, and we could do it for its based driver and then return it to the backend. And then driver would be assigned to a customer, and they would go off and take the customer to Kubernetes to do the language session. And we did just Kubernetes because we had a science for the new Docker packaging up into dependencies. So we managed all of them. And then we had a side of things like general orchestration, orchestration, process isolation, self healing, and some of the clusters, things like that. But we were feeling uncomfortable with this decision because the learning curve of Kubernetes in the stock was quite high compared to just deploying on a little cloud and some cloud ML engine. So we were not sure about this decision. But over time, as the systems developed and evolved, we, we started to realize that it actually wasn't such a bad decision. So we, the, the next step here was we were deploying more and more models and services. And what we realized we needed to have experimentation. So one of the great things about Kubernetes is it's standardized from control plan and API. And this is something that a lot of people don't really talk about. Um, but when you're building a platform on top of Kubernetes, this is one of the biggest advantages to it. So what we wanted was just a simple interface for data scientists and other users to define traffic routing configurations. So we built a UI for them, and have that affect the way experiments are run on the client for traffic in the cluster. So the, the driver lists would come in, they would, be, they would already set their uh, routing preferences, and uh, the way that, that the, the request are routed is through it in a proxy. But this proxy gets configured by a traffic manager and the way that the traffic manager interacts with the configuration is through this the Kubernetes API. So the API updates a config map, and that templates a configuration within that router. Um, so this worked really well for us because there's loose coupling between these services. And the Kubernetes API allows you to have these services loosely coupled. So any service in the cluster that wants to subscribe or look at that data to inform its decision making can do so. So already this was paying dividends for standardizing on Kubernetes. So the second thing we realized was that um, we, we wanted to uh, support more complex types of models. Just having an, a model in an API is not good enough. So we wanted to be able to do something like have multiple models, and then depending on the user, depending on the incoming request, depending on the location, you, you, you for example, send all of those models, this request, and see which one is the most confident in its response. Or you send a request to two models, maybe one is fast and one is slow, but the accuracy differs. Um, then you have a timeout if the one that's too slow takes too long, but if it gets back with a very good response, then we use that. So the orchestrator that we built for this was called, is called Lasso, and you define, uh, through for Lasso, you define these workflows. Um, so this is just a very basic example with one single step, which is a control step. 
Uh, but you defend, it essentially had this long uh, YAML that defines the workflow. So it's an inference graph, essentially. And uh, a similar one you can be found if you look at Selden's inference graphs, which is an open source project. Lasso is not open source. But essentially what this allows you to do is the incoming request comes in and it orchestrates that request across these models and it essentially builds a hybrid or ensemble system out of multiple models. So it's very important for us. And already this was paying dividends because um, Kubernetes gave us a shared execution environment. So all of these models are running in the, in the same place. Um, so the standardizing that uh, the, the execution environment was very important for us. We weren't calling an API and a VM and then some other managed service. Everything's in one place. And we could version control these, these workflows with our cluster config, our manifests. And that consistency between those and the fact that you could look at, let's say, one git repo to see what your whole cluster was doing uh, was very, very compelling for us from an operational standpoint. And then there's some non-machine learning benefits to running ML as well. If you have your whole organization standardizing on Kubernetes, then uh, normal product engineers or infrastructure engineers can build tools that you benefit from. And this is something that also a lot of people don't talk about. But in our case, we want to analyze experiments that we're running. So a request comes into a model, and some action is taken. But we actually wanted to log those requests. I mean, initially, we logged into the console. But we were experiencing back pressure from logging to the console because the throughput was so high. One of the teams in, in, in project built a logging sidecar. So you run that container on your nodes, and your model can just log to a port on the local host, and it will publish those results to a stream, and uh, it will get sunk into a BigQuery where the, the data scientists can do analysis. So we benefit from Gojek engineers and the open source community building these components, either uh, packaged up as Helm charts or just uh, containers that we could deploy in our system as well. So, so this helps us when we're building out our platform. And for all these infrastructural reasons um, or, or these areas, we benefit from that. But one of the things I wasn't showing you earlier was that if you don't just have model services in production. In real production so, um, systems, you also have to have data available. Because these requests are coming in, and they only have entity IDs, like the driver's ID. But you need to enrich those IDs with uh, feature data in order to make intelligent decisions, in order to actually score and compare these drivers with a model. You can't just look at IDs. And so what we do is we need to somehow load data into these databases. And uh, there's two ways you can do that. It's either real time or it's batch. And in the case of real time, Kubernetes makes it easy because you can deploy auto scaling consumers that just stream in data from uh, PubSub or Kafka in our case, and it fills up uh, these stores. So in our case, originally we just had Redis pods that we deployed with each model service. This worked really well for us. One of the great things about Kubernetes was that it, is that it has a jobs API. So you can do something like uh, when you deploy, you trigger a job to pull in a, a file, Parquet or CSV, populate a Redis that's been deployed. Once that's done, the uh, readiness probes are good to go, and your service comes online. So it has all this API functionality that makes orchestrating startup and shutdown of these immutable data sets very simple. Um, and but one of the one of the problems here was that um, I said one more thing to say is that one of the other benefits if you're doing if you're using something like Kubeflow pipelines and you're orchestrating large workloads, Kubernetes also has great resource utilization and scheduling. So if you're training a let's say model and you need a GPU, it'll find the node that, that has the GPU. If, it, if you need to have 100 gigabytes or 200 gigabytes of RAM, it'll find that node. And these are small things, I think, to a data scientist. They just want to abstract it away. But from an engineering perspective, it can be hard to do that if you're using a VM or some other um, uh, less abstracted uh, platform. So one of the things I wasn't, one of the things we ran into was that uh, it, well, there was a big problem was the duplication of our feature data for these model services. So in our case, a lot of these features were duplicated across these uh, databases because they were uh, ind independently deployed. Uh, not just from a operational or production standpoint, but also from a creation standpoint. So we realized that um, we wanted to, to build a system that would allow us to deduplicate the work that the data science were doing in creating this feature data, as well as uh, provide consistency between our training environment and our serving environment. And th this project was uh, feasible, one of our big project, which is a feature store. And it essentially can be divided into two areas. You have two personas that interact with the system. On one side, you have data scientists creating data in the form of, let's say, batch, street, uh, batch data, like data sets in BigQuery or uh, files in an object store. They're, they want to 
authoring the, the data in the first place, but then you have users of that data, the ML engineers, that are going to uh, export a uh, features, uh, a data set from uh, the BigQuery or some other store, train their model, and they want to take that model into production. But we had a lot of problems uh, with this. Firstly, there was a lot of duplication in the data that was being created here. Features were being recreated by teams over and over and over again. The data transformation tasks here will be duplicated when you go from uh, batch data to stream data. So in batch they're using Python, in streams they're using Java or Go for performance reasons. And this created a lot of uh, model serving skew for uh, data science, for ML engineers in production, because the models being trained on data is different from serving. And it's very, very difficult to detect. And I think a lot of companies are uh, tolerating some skew there because of the challenge between, the challenge in getting the consistency there. But also we had an issue in serving because we had to deploy so many Redis nodes. Um, and uh, the, the operational challenge of uh, maintaining these databases in production was very high. So we wanted to abstract that as, away as much as possible because it's a very standardized pattern actually. So we built a system called Feast, which is a feature store which bridges these two, com these two worlds. And this allows us to uh, ingest in all of our uh, batch data as well as our streaming data and store it into two stores. And this ingestion job is consistent in that it's a single job that uh, loads in this data and stores into both stores at the same time. So you have historical store of feature data in BigQuery in our case, but we could support other stores. And we also have a real-time store, which can be either Bigtable or Redis. And so these stores are consistent with each other um, because it's the same stream writing to both of them. So our ML engineer in this case has an API which will show you a little bit later that they can interact with the store to export data and they can train their model and then using that same contract of let's say the list of features, they take the contract to serving where they can query the data. But on serving, the, it's it's optimized for latency, so very, very low latency. If you're using Redis, you can get five millisecond, 10 millisecond uh, lookups, sometimes even less. But, but for the warehouse, it's about scale. So if you're using BigQuery, you can you can export uh, terabytes of data and it will be pretty quick. Um, so what, what Feast also provided was a, a way for us to centralize our feature management so everybody could find what features had already been developed and declared and registered. So there's less duplication, more discovery, uh, more reuse, and, and scalability. So if you go back to our previous slide, uh, so Feast in this stack would replace all of those Redis pods. So you'd have a feast serving that's constantly being updated by a stream. All of your models can just, with their specific contract of features that they need, query the feature data that they want on serving. Um, so one of the questions we have is, why is it important to have Kubernetes in this case? Why can't we deploy feast in the uh, VM or um, make a managed service or something? I think the point here is that uh, Kubernetes is very composable. Even if you have a complex system like a feature store, you can deploy it in your cluster. If you have a pager at 2 a.m. that your system's going down, you don't want to look at 10 different services and products. You can just go to a Kubernetes cluster and find everything there, all of your logs, um, all of the data to debug that issue. And this is what uh, was compelling for us in our feeds. And then our expansion. So uh, one of the things that was also very challenging for us was um, firstly, we had said one of our products like Go Ride and Ride heading motor on motorcycles in Indonesia. We would have an expansion of deployments and we'd run experiments across these deployments. But we'd also branch out into multiple service types, right? So for each of those service types, we'd have all of these models running. So the scale was exploding in terms of managing a lot of services. And you don't want to hire 10 people to you know, manage your 10xing um, of scale. So um, we wanted to technology solve the problem of scaling out to more service types and more markets. So we're also expanding from Indonesia to Singapore to Vietnam um, and to Thailand. Um, so the way we dealt with this was through um, following a GitOps style, um, a GitOps style of version controlling all of our infrastructure as well as all of our Kubernetes uh, manifests and code. So what this allows us to do is have a, a much better service to engineering ratio so we can maintain um, basically all of our Kubernetes clusters, all of the components get deployed in there, um, and then um, yeah, pretty, pretty much all of our code in Git. Um, so this gives us a very high portability. When we go into a new market, we can just redeploy that with some slight changes and some slight, some slight configuration uh, differences. 
So this was very important for us, but it's not just important in terms of scale, and uh, human scale, for example. Um, it's also important in traceability. If you want, if you deploy something and you know that it's in that model, it's becoming well, you might be able to go back and look at what actually went into that system. So I'll show you in a quick example. Um, sorry, there's also a great link here about our engineers if you want to have a little bit of like um, GitOps at Gojek. But I'll show you why it's important to have that traceability. Um, so it's, I'll take you through a basic example of how we do CI, CD, and the data science team. Um, you typically have a model training pipeline and set some Kubeflow pipelines. So this will just take in some inputs and say this the features, let's say it's some uh, data sets or um, whatever it is, your target variable, and you run a pipeline. So what we do is we, we track each one of these inputs, we track the pipeline code, and then you'll have a bunch of artifacts that are created from that. And these artifacts together will form a system, and that system has some function, let's say it's your driver allocation system. But it's important to know which one of which of these components go into making the system, the ingredients into the recipe, and uh, together you want to be able to version them. So what we do is we monitor the artifact stores, whether it's Git, whether it's a model store. In our case, we, we use MLflow or a container registry, and we use GoCD. So it's basically pulling those registries for the latest versions. And if anything changes there, let's say you've got a pipeline produces a new model, um, it increments the version and deploys that. And so in this case, let's say it deploys that as a new system into production. And it assigns a new unique version to that, that, that whole system. The reason why this is important is because what you can do is you can um, tr track all of these ingredients into your, all of these components into your system and compare that to the outcome because this whole system is the thing that is actually um, influencing what the business outcome is. And that's all you care about is the business outcome. So if it's doing really well, then you can tie that back to specific components that went in, artifacts that went into that deployment. And if it's not doing well, you can also understand why. And this is something we're really focusing on right now, standardizing this layer of tracking and tracing within Goji. Obviously not just in this one system, but in all of our systems. And we're working with the Kubeflow team to build a maintenance layer. They're doing most of the work. We're just giving them our requirements, basically. <laughs> and uh, they're, they're standardizing this using a lot of the open source technologies from the TFX team and gathering the feedback from a lot of folks. Um, but internally, we've, we've got this layer, but it's not standardized. Um, but we want to um, use whatever the, the Kubeflow team and community are um, presenting as best practices. So just to wrap up some of the good parts about um, Kubernetes <coughs> and ML on uh, Kubeflow, um, it's, there's a large ecosystem in the ML uh, on, on Kubernetes uh, for machine learning. Um, it's really vibrant. There's a lot going on right now, so you can benefit from that. But the standardized control plane is a great thing for building out platforms. So Kubernetes is not the end state, but building a platform on Kubernetes is, is the end state, and it's good for that. Running workloads is great. As long as they're not stateful, stateful is still a bit tricky. Um, having everything in a single environment makes operations a lot simpler. And if you follow a GitOps-based model of version controlling all of your code, um, it, it, gives, it gives you a lot of portability, and it allows you to track and trace what goes into your systems and, and monitor your outcomes and tie it back um, to those artifacts. Um, what still sucks is the multi-tenancy. I think this is one of our biggest challenges, is that data scientists in Gojek are quite good, uh, good engineers in a lot of cases. They want to dive into the cluster and see why something went wrong or what, what's up with that. And often you want to have abstraction there. Um, you don't want to give them full access, but you also do want to uh, have them peel away the layers if they have to. So th the multi-tenancy aspect is something we're trying to solve right now. Stateful systems are hard, so running databases that retain state within a cluster is still tricky. We're currently using a lot of managed services to do that, extend to the cluster. And then we still have a lot of leaky abstractions, especially in Kubeflow, where a data scientist is required to set an annotation or a CRD. Let's say they want to access a GPU. So that's, that's still a flexibility concern and a trade-off, but right now it is still a pain point. Uh, so what's coming up next is we are looking at improving the user experience. So we've addressed a lot of the engineering and operational concerns with our platform. We want to make it easier for that long tail of users. So the analysts and the data scientists that want an easy UI, and we want to address their concerns um, and give them a higher abstraction. Um, and we're also looking at in standardizing our metadata layer and then in incorporating Istio for better tracing and um, for request and responses. And I'll leave you on this uh, tweet by Kelsey Hightower. Kube is a great place to build a platform, but it's not the end game. And I think that's what we found as well building out on Cube and Cube um, So I'll pass to Chris.
where he can take you through uh, the demo. Um, hello. Oh, I don't know if this is on. Oh, this is working. I'm sorry? Oh, you want me to use this one? Okay, that's fine. Uh, yeah, there we go. Okay. Can you guys hear me? Okay, hi. I'm Chris. I'm a technical program manager at Google Cloud. So I work with people like Jan that you just saw. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm helping Gojek uh, with some of their ML platform uh, challenges, uh, and I have the uh, pleasure to show uh, the demo today. Uh, so I was one of the uh, few product managers in Qflow uh, in the beginning, and then uh, the Qflow as a project actually uh, changed a lot over last year. Um, and there's a, like what Willem mentioned, uh, there's a lot of activity, excitement, uh, and a lot of contributors. Uh, so ho hopefully we can see some of that as well. All right, so let me, um, kind of go through the slide here. So Qflow uh, is an open uh, Kubernetes, uh, Kubernetes native platform for ML. And this is our mantra, and this is our goal. Uh, make it easy for everyone uh, to develop, deploy, and manage portable distributed ML on Kubernetes. There's a lot of words there. Uh, but those things are all kind of important, and it kind of needs to work well together uh, for a lot of data scientists um, for customers like Gojek uh, to work well together and also let the data scientists focus on data science problem itself rather than the engineering or infrastructure problem. All right, so I'm going to take a look at the demo here so we can kind of look at, look at the Kubeflow and look, um, see what it looks like. All right, so Kubeflow. Um, so this is our UI. Uh, so there's a web app that you can use to deploy uh, into your GCP project. Um, and we have a nice UI to uh, kind of uh, go through some of the applications. Uh, so the first left here is the docs. So, so this just takes us to the Qflow web, um, web page. And then the, uh, the first application here is notebooks, uh, also TF job dashboard. So if you were to deploy a TensorFlow job, uh, you can monitor how, how it's actually working. And then here's CatTib, uh, which is our um, hyperparameter tuning uh, application that we work with uh, in Qflow. And then pipeline dashboard. So I'm going to go through what the actual pipeline looks like once we um, launch some of those experiments. But let's start with notebooks, since that's where everyone works uh, in data science world. Uh, so if you were to uh, deploy a new server or uh, spawn a new um, notebook, uh, this is what it looks like for us. Uh, so you can just easily uh, deploy a new notebook, um, new notebook server by filling out a form here. As we provide a lot of uh, standard images that you can use to uh, quickly start work for data scientists, uh, but also you can specify a custom image so that you can uh, put your own requirements in there for enterprise customers that require special packages and libraries and whatnot. Uh, and you can. Uh, specify some of the resources uh, that you require. So like what Willem said earlier, um, for data science, it's important to kind of focus on the work that they're doing rather than uh, worrying about CPUs or memories or things like that. So Kubernetes uh, do a lot of that work for us. Um, and Qflow abstracts it even more uh, by making it easy for a data scientist to work in the uh, workspace here. Uh, you can attach a workspace volume, like a hardware, uh, oh, sorry, not hardware, um, for the, like a disk, uh, if, you, if you need to uh, add uh, more data uh, for, for the work, uh, and specify any other extra resources like GPU over here, and then uh, spawn uh, the uh, notebook server. Uh, so I've already done that for us. Uh, so let's go back. Uh, cancel, maybe. And then um, in the demo, and if you were to connect, uh, just what our server looks like. And uh, I took out what the our demo notebook over here. Oh, not that one. Oh, it's this guy, this guy over here. There you go. All right, so I'm going to go through uh, what what's in the notebook. Uh, and in the, uh, in the process of explaining, I'm going to turn it back over to Willem to talk about Feast and how that really looks like uh, in kind of an example workload here. Uh, so 
in this notebook, we're working with a data set uh, that is uh, collecting all the taxi ride information, uh, fare information from Chicago. And this is a popular data set for data scientists to do any research or uh, practice any of their um, uh, models uh, and to predict some fares. Um, so in, in the uh, beginning of the notebook, uh, we are defining some requirements and uh, importing uh, different libraries. And let's go down. So uh, fairing, as um, uh, Willem mentioned here, makes it easy for uh, data scientists to define all the code and then uh, put it in a notebook and not leave the notebook and be able to manage all the work that they need to do uh, to package it up and deploy uh, the work. So at this point, uh, if, if you're a data scientist working with the data set, you probably want to take a look at the data uh, and load all the libraries, and then let's see what it could potentially look like. So uh, we're going to use Feast uh, to load the data. Um, but you could potentially use a streaming um, logs uh, into, uh, into uh, Feast. But right now, we're just using Pandas uh, data frame here to just illustrate that we're going to uh, load the data into Feast. Uh, so in defining the features um, in, with the data frame, or working with uh, some of the features here around distance, uh, pickup latitude, some of the locations, um, and also not only the origination, but also destination of uh, where things are going, uh, where the uh, passenger is going, and a couple of the other features that might be important. So we're just trying to see, uh, okay, maybe let's look at some of these features, uh, see what it could potentially look like. Uh, and at this point, we're going to uh, use the feast uh, to load the features in and then uh, prepare uh, the data for addition analysis. So let me turn over to Willem. Right, so at this point, um, we're instantiating an importer. And what this importer is doing is it's essentially taking the pandas data frame and it's um, starting a data flow job. Or in this case, it's data flow, but it doesn't have to run a data flow. It can also be a beam direct runner if you're on frame and it loads that data uh, frame into Feast. So in a production environment, you would probably have this step at the back of your ETL pipeline, the final step where you transform your data, or you'd run a similar importer stream to stream. So you wouldn't have to do this every time, you'd just be consuming data from Feast. But in this case, we're just illustrating this um, for the sake of completeness. Um, so what we're doing here is we're ingesting those, that data frame, and we're also defining the features. So we're mapping the columns of the frame um, two specific features, and if those features do not exist yet, we're saying create them, and we're doing that with this apply feature and apply entity. So it's going to create a right entity, and it's going to create a list of features and map the columns of the data to those. So we've already run this import, so you can see it's, it's creating all those entities and features, and then it's running an import. Then what we do is we are defining a feature set, and this is one of the key things of Feast is I think essentially a contract between training and serving. And that contract in this case is the feature set, the list of features that you want to use to train the model. So in this case, the two, the two uh, lists here are the entity and the training feature set. And we uh, create an instance of this. And then what we do is we retrieve a, a data set and materialize that data set as a data, data frame locally. So in this case, it seems a little bit redundant because we've just ingested and ex extracted again. But in production, the data would come from many different sources. Um, so we, we've extracted that data and we've done it over a time range. And if you run this uh, head, you'll see that it is actually a data frame and the data is available there. So I'll pass back to Chris and let him continue with the, the demo. Sure. Thank you. Um, so as William said, uh, so we have uh, the data into uh, in Feast, and if you're a data scientist, before you work with data, you would probably go through a exploratory data analysis phase where you kind of want to take a look at, take a peek at the data, get some stati statistics, um, and try to see if there's any predictor that might be helpful uh, for your data science problem. Um, so in this case, we're using a uh, application called TensorFlow Data, Val uh, data Validation, or TFDV. Um, and we get a lot of questions like, how does TFX uh, ecosystem work with uh, Qflow? Uh, so internally, like, w they work really uh, closely together. Uh, and we want to make Qflow uh, the best place to run TensorFlow um, extended components like uh, TFDB. Um, and, uh, and, and Qflow makes it easy for uh, TFX uh, uh, Docker images to run uh, because everything's managed on Kubernetes. Uh, so if you were to run TFDB over here, 
and run the uh, visuals, uh, visualize statistics command. And then you get a nice uh, UI uh, with a bunch of uh, number, um, important statistics values like mean, standard deviation, and other um, information about the data, data set that could be useful for data scientists. And uh, this visualization is done through facets, and you can actually interact with it. It's kind of nice to see. And uh, get a little more information around it. And maybe get some uh, good idea about okay, maybe I can work with this data, work with this data or not, or if you want to uh, continue to munge it to see if it makes sense, uh, then you can continue to work in those notebook cells. Okay, so I'm 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 kind of happy with the feature set that I have. It looks like it has all the things I need. Uh, then I'm going to uh, create this uh, feature set and then uh, go, uh, initiate it and then also uh, write my train code uh, so that I can. Uh, do my uh, linear model um, linear model prediction. Uh, so in this training code, if you look here, uh, that we're going through the uh, training feature set from Feast that was defined earlier, uh, and just going through them and then uh, creating our um, uh, training code training code for uh, training the model. Uh, and in this part right here, we're specifying uh, the time range so that if you were to uh, run some different types of predictions uh, or training sets are based on time range. Maybe, uh, maybe that's a good way to uh, work with the data for your problem. Uh, in this prediction code over here, uh, we're logging some information and also working with uh, different types of uh, features to, for prediction um, workload. And as you can see uh, that we're trying to minimize the, the serving and training skew that we were talking about before by using Feast and using the same column names. And there's some uh, uh, saving the model, and we run the training over here, and you're using the same image and the same uh, uh, the model, and run local prediction. And um, maybe uh, you know at this point you might be happy with the prediction uh, value that you get, and it might be okay with it. Um, and now you're ready to uh, perhaps deploy the model. So instead of uh, taking this model and maybe uh, you know, going to a different ID, ID or um, going to a different application or product to take the model and to deploy it, you can do everything within uh, this one environment notebook because of the fairing. Uh, so fairing is a project within Kubernetes uh, to help uh, the data scientists by packaging uh, the code that they wrote from notebook and, and um, turn it into a container and deploy it in Kubernetes. So in order for you to do that, there's only a couple things you have to specify. Uh, so there's two uh, var variables that you just need to put in here, or there's a base image and the Docker, uh, the location of where you wanna uh, publish it. And you can uh, do a little more uh, by uh, just uh, writing some builder code uh, to build it. And then all you have to do is uh, launch the job with a couple more code, and then you're done. Uh, so at this point, uh, what it would do is uh, as you can see from the logs, it would just uh, launch the job to train the model, um, and you know, um, trying to see if uh, if we can do like more of a distributed training uh, type of workload here. Okay, let me just skip down here. Okay, so after the training is done, uh, that we have the trained model, uh, that we can deploy the model uh, using Kubeflow uh, with a couple lines over here, and in um, uh, sorry. Oh, and with the, with the fairing, uh, one of the benefits that it can have is that uh, you can easily make an um, uh, endpoint here with, uh, with uh, uh, two lines of code over here. Uh, so you can do a REST API call uh, through that endpoint. And you can, do, um, a couple with a couple more lines of code, you can call the prediction endpoint and see how it performs. And uh, perhaps you are ready to like deploy this in uh, production. Uh, sorry, deploy this in production uh, using um, and want to be able to uh, repeat this in pipelines. So, uh, pipe, uh, Qflow pipelines is a project that was developed by Google to um, easily allow uh, the work, the the steps of work that you have seen so far. Uh, the data a data scientist would do a notebook and package it and be able to uh, deploy these pipelines and also make it reproducible and be able to uh, also share uh, with the uh, other folks within your uh, within your enterprise. So, uh, in Qflow Pipelines SDK, 
Uh, there's a couple lines of uh, li a couple lines here that you specify the name and the description uh, within the pipeline, and you can uh, point to the model. And each step of the uh, the code that you saw earlier, the training, the prediction, uh, and deployment, um, the, the validation deployment, they can be uh, Dockerized, um, uh, containerized over here, and it'll become a, a operator or like it's, it'll become an operation within pipelines. Uh, so you just specify for each of the step, uh, give it some name and also uh, what kind of range of data that you want, like you saw earlier, um, and package it up, uh, package up the, the valid, uh, validation step. And with a couple more lines, you can uh, deploy it into production and uh, by submitting to uh, the pipeline run. So when you submit the, uh, the pipeline, it will look something like this. Uh, so that it will give you a nice graph of um, how each of the operations look like in succession. And this can get really complicated, you know, depending on uh, what you're trying to do, or it can be some, uh, very simple, something like this. OK? All right, uh, so let me go back to the uh, presentation here. OK. so. What you just saw was uh, that we fetched, we loaded and also fetched data from Feast for training. And this is a very uh, positive thing for data science because again, like what William said, uh, you, you do not have to necessarily uh, recreate features uh, all the time and duplicate it. So you just take on more storage or it costs more for the company uh, or it just takes longer. Um, so when you uh, publish those features into Feast, you can also uh, minimize the training and uh, serving SKU or eliminate it altogether uh, by using the same features from same feature store. Uh, so as you saw that we took those features out and also developed the model through uh, the training code and we deployed those uh, trained models into Kubernetes uh, by doing the deployment and uh, fetch data at serving time for inference for uh, the uh, from machine learning problem. So, in the Kubeflow, uh, in our project, we want to be able to provide all these steps that are typical for machine learning development in, in one platform. We want to make it easy for data scientists to uh, do their job and not have to worry about the infrastructure challenges and any other complexities that they might not be uh, so keen to do. Uh, most, like what Willem said, most data scientists are uh, strong engineers, uh, and but then they didn't become data scientists be, to do engineering necessarily, but they want to do more scientist type of work. Uh, so in Kubeflow, we, we want to uh, make it easy for people to uh, do their job, uh, to, to do their data scientist work, and also want to give them option to switch out different components if they want to. Uh, so for example, in serving, uh, so we have, uh, if you're doing developing model intensive flow, uh, you can use the TF serving. Or if you're using uh, PyTorch or um, I don't know, like XGBoost, that uh, you can use Selden, and it's very easy to switch that out uh, and then just make it part of your uh, deployment story. Um, and again, yeah, Kubeflow makes it easy for uh, for, uh, for anyone to run these steps on Kubernetes. And here are a couple uh, tenets that I want to just highlight: uh, that com uh, composability, scalability, and portability is important for a Kubeflow project. Um, so because we, we know that uh, your first development workflow typically starts within your local disk or sorry, local uh, laptop, uh, so we want to make a uh, data scientist workflow not uh, very intrusive. So we want to make a Kubeflow um, easy to use in a local environment or even in on-prem. Uh, a couple of the uh, customers that I work with have uh, their own data centers or clusters uh, that with uh, specific hardware requirements or regulation issues. Uh, so we want to be able to use Kubeflow in any environment. And obviously, as you saw, um, you know, in public cloud, uh, in like in Google Cloud, we want to make uh, Kubeflow easy to use there as well. Um, in addition, like the number of users and workload size, uh, these things should not be an issue, in my uh, personal opinion, for data scientists to worry about. It just needs to work. It just needs to be able to burst into cloud and uh, scale out. Uh, and composability using your own library or framework, uh, like Feast, uh, because Feast is you know, a, a different open source project that was also brought in to be part of the Kubeflow ecosystem. Uh, it's, it's not that difficult to um, uh, in, include other folks that, are, uh, that want to be part of the Kubeflow platform. And this is um, uh, proven by you know, a lot of other components that you can see when you go to our website and then uh, see all the other different contributors. 
uh, quickly in the Qflow architecture, because I see the time is running out. Um, the, this is what our uh, Qflow cluster uh, architecture looks like. I'll just give you a second to look at that. Are you guys going to share this afterwards as slides? Is that, is that right? Yes, I think so, yeah. Uh, so <coughs> when you, you uh, deploy Qflow, uh, everything is within one cluster, uh, and then you can see the shared namespaces, which makes it really easy for uh, people to manage um, you know, their workload. And also, you can connect to uh, either the laptop or the, uh, uh, the cloud resources and, be, um, and have those data sets uh, that are either available in cloud or you just want to download some of it and then use from your, you know, from your local disk for uh, whatever reason, for the explore, exploration reasons. Uh, it makes it easy for us to do that. Um, as you can see, there are many companies that are uh, part of the Qflow project. And then we have over uh, 30 companies or so that are actually, that, that not everyone's listed here, but there's some uh, big names that you might recognize. And from uh, the number of PRs in the last 28 days, you can see that it's exploding. Uh, and this is actually just keeps going up and you can see this is the uh, end of April, so it just goes until. Uh, there's, there's a lot of momentum and I see like new working groups that are also being formed. So originally there was only one working group, uh, but after I joined, uh, we, uh, we started the product manager group and now there's a serving group and an on-prem group uh, with the launch of Anthos. Uh, that I see a lot of uh, clients that are interested in using Anthos and Qflow on top of that so that they can use uh, the Kubernetes that are on-prem and also in public cloud as a, as a seamless experience. One of the goals that we have in our project is low bar, high ceiling. So we want to make it easy for people to start, but also uh, expand and make it as complex as they want to, because not all one size fits all. Uh, so we want to make it easy for everyone to bring their own requirements also and use our platform to solve their own uh, machine learning challenges. Okay, uh, just a call to action slide here. I would highly encourage you guys to check out our website and install Qflow. And also install Feast. Uh, Feast, I think, is a, one of the key uh, missing pieces that we had. Uh, Feast, Feast is super useful for any production uh, data, scientist, uh, uh, data scientist team. Uh, and also uh, give it a shot, uh, trying uh, Fairing plus Feast, like in the example notebook that you just saw. So that's available in this link. OK. Well, thank you very much for your time. Uh, and then I uh, hope you guys have uh, the rest of the day. Uh, maybe questions? How much time does it take for you to put this together from the moment of the answer?